we start to talk about, we'll start new material today. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the molecular biology. Then we're going to review the quiz that we got yesterday. Uh, we're going to talk about the lab and the results there. It's going to be a pretty short talk. And then we're going to continue talking. Before we start with the molecular biology, do you have any questions about the study guide yet? No, not yet. If you do ask, come on, it's, it's, look, I, I cannot read your mind and I'm really happy that I cannot, otherwise I would learn a lot of different things about myself, so I don't know what, what kinds of, you know, possible problems you can experience, okay? So, um, not to scare you, this part that includes the discussion of molecular biology, and then we're going to talk about the metabolism of microbes. This part is arguably the hardest. It may be the one of the smallest in terms of the, the number of slides, but it's probably the most complex material and it's also very abstract. If you cannot touch something, if you cannot really relate to something, it's often hard to comprehend. So what I'm trying to say is not that I'm trying to screw you over in that material and gave, give all of you Fs for the exam. God forbid, no, I hate to do that. More, more so that you please focus. Don't hesitate to ask me questions. I told, I, I don't remember if I told you before, I, I have a policy of that you cannot ask stupid questions. Any question that you ask is not stupid by definition. Does that make sense? Whatever, if, if you think I told you that, it's not a problem. I will be happy to say it again. If you think that I told you that 25 times before, it's fine. I'll repeat it 26th time. It's, it's okay. Just please make sure that you understand what we're talking about here. Right? So we're going to, we're going to chat about processes that involve, um, genes. Right? We're going to talk about the, gene expression in the cells. We're going to talk about replication of the genes in the cell. Those are two different distinct processes. Okay. But to understand what's going on there, first we have to figure out, well, talk a little bit more about the structure of the molecules involved. And we're going to start with the DNA, of course. So DNA molecule that carries the genetic information consists of elementary building blocks there are four of them okay that we call nucleotides right nucleotides can be of two different types essentially each nucleotide is the a large organic molecule that consists of three major parts which we're gonna which we're gonna describe bless you so um, there are there's one part that is called nitrogen base nitrogen and nitrogenous base okay there are um, two distinct types of nitrogenous bases pyrimidine bases and purine bases in DNA two pyrimidine bases are cytosine and thymine you can see them on the picture to your left you see that they have slightly they, they, they smaller okay they have uh, a little simpler structure and two purine bases in the DNA I did a little bit of a color co coding here is adenine and guanine they are more complex okay does that make sense so far so two types each type is two um, bases adenine and, and thymine are sorry adenine and guanine are pyrimidine and thymine and cytosine uh, are, are pyrimidine so purines pyrimidines when this nitrogenous basis link to the 
deoxyribose sugar. You can see it on the picture to the right. It is highlighted in a blue, so that's your deoxyribose sugar. Altogether, sugar and base form nucleoside. Does that make sense? Sugar and base form nucleoside. If you throw in the third part, the phosphate residue, which you can see here, phosphate, deoxyribose sugar, and nitrogenous base form finally nucleotide. So far, do you follow me? Let's review what we just learned. Each nucleotide consists of three parts, phosphate residue, deoxyribose sugar and nitrogenous base. Nitrogenous bases can be of two distinct types. They can be pyrimidines, cytosinothiamine, or purines, adenine or guanine. Why we call sugar deoxyribose? In the position to prime here that I circled with green, you do not have hydroxyl group. You have hydrogen instead. Okay. Answering the question that you didn't ask yet, you shouldn't be so timid in asking questions. Do you need to know the structures of nucleoside or nucleosides? Do you need to know the structure of the sugar? Do you need to know the structure of phosphate? The answer is you don't. I'm not going to ask you to picture it. Okay, does that make sense? So don't waste time on learning the exact positions of atoms in any of those molecules. I will not ask this on the exam. Am I clear? Good? Okay, let's move on. Phosphate and sugar molecules form what is called a backbone, often called sugar phosphate backbone, of the DNA molecule. Now phosphate in the, the entire DNA molecule, each phosphate residue links five prime and three prime carbons of the sugar. Again, I'm answering unasked questions. Why the heck is prime? Can anybody tell me why? numbers of the carbons in the sugar residue have prime. We have two distinct parts that are organic. One is sugar, one is base. To avoid confusion, carbons in the base, like this carbon, or this carbon, or this carbon, are numbered normally one two three four and so on does that make sense carbons in a sugar they have added prime so one prime two prime three prime just to avoid confusion is that clear there's there's nothing deep behind it no magical or philosophical sense just simplicity in number okay so Sugars, again, let's go back to it. The, the phosphate links 3 prime to 5 prime. And that gives the DNA molecule, the one DNA strand, gives it directionality. What do I mean by that? I have two analogies. Analogy number one, a train. Or, no, train is not a perfect one. Okay, uh, what's that dance when people, I, last, last semester student told me the name of the dance, but I forgot. When people, you know, hold each other's hips and just stand, you know, next person facing the back of the front person and just walk, you know, like a centipede. Ah, say again? Probably, yeah, it's conga line. 
Th that's right. So uh, people stand in a certain direction, right? I mean, you face the back of the person in front of you. You don't stand like, you know, back to back. It's going to be extremely inconvenient to dance like this. So that's directionality. Does that make sense? DNA is the same way. All of the sugars are oriented in the same way. Five prime is linked to three prime. This five prime will be linked to the three prime somewhere here. This five prime is linked to this three prime. So that's a directionality. Does that make sense? Why it is important? It allows us to record information. Directionality is actually necessary to record information. Those of you who write notes, in which direction do you write? Left to right, right? So you have a direction. You don't do right to left. Some languages do. Say Arabic, Hebrew, they have... Up. Is that okay? Absolutely. As long as everybody agrees. Does that make sense? It's important. As long as everybody agrees on a certain direction, that's fine. Okay? So enzymes that read the information in the DNA, they actually read the information in a certain direction. And that directionality of the molecule is what enables it. Right? Does that make sense? So this nucleotides are arranged into double-stranded, double-helix molecule. Okay, it's right-handed, which means it's a, uh, it rotates clockwise. Um, ten nucleotides, approximately ten nucleotides per turn. Um, this is the great example of DNA. And if you would look at this double helix molecule, you will notice that there are two grooves, the minor groove and the major groove. I highlighted minor groove with the red color and the major groove with the blue color. This structural features may look unimportant, however, bless you, However, grooves, minor and major grooves, are the sites where different proteins bind. Proteins that copy DNA, that read DNA, that maybe unwind DNA. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so minor and major grooves are sites of protein binding. Now, I'm, you know, I, you probably know this, I digress sometimes. Um, in my personal opinion, the discovery of double helix is one of the defining moments in the history of science in 20th century. And interestingly enough, we know the day. Well, we don't really know the day, like, oh, we discovered it today at 7 a.m. in the morning. But April 1st, 1953 is the date when the paper by Watson uh, Creek and Morris Wilkins uh, was published in Nature. You can, this paper is publicly available. It's small, uh, about one and a half pages, uh, very condensed. But since then, April 1st of 1953 is considered to be a birthday of modern molecular biology. And if you think about this, the consequences of it are just unbelievable. We have completely different medicine now. Totally different medicine. We can look inside of the organisms. We can look inside of humans, animals, plants, bacteria. We can genetically modify organisms. We know what's going on at the cellular level in very intimate details. All of it because of the work that, well, not that, you know, they did that and in one minute we were capable of doing all that stuff. No. But it was the first work, first discovery in line of many others that pretty much paved the pathway towards what we have now. I would definitely put it on the same 
scale as, I don't know, relativity theory or understanding of how atoms work. And it, it's also, it's not a single discovery in each of those fields, but it's, it's great discovery, one of the greatest of the 20th century. So what, what Watson, Crick, and Wilkins did, and I must say, there was a fourth person, uh, Dr. Rosalind Franklin. She wasn't included in the publication. Any idea why? Yes. She was a woman, so they didn't include her in publication, and her role was acknowledged many years later. Unfortunately, post-mortem, she died because she was uh, an x-ray technologist, she was a physicist, x-ray physicist. She died because of the cancer, due to the constant exposure to x-rays. Uh, and Nobel Prize, can, she wasn't awarded Nobel Prize, so it was a huge unfairness towards her. So. They discovered the actual structure, that it's a double helix. An understanding of the structure allowed further development of technologies and further discoveries in how the goddamn thing works. So it turns out those two strands are held together by the interaction between bases. They pair, and this pairing is very strict. A pairs with T, and G pairs with C. Right? You can see that a pair of A and C is held, is held together by two hydrogen bonds. A pair of G and C is held together by three hydrogen bonds. Which pair is going to be, which bond, which pair is going to be stronger? G and C, exactly, exactly. Is that important? Or it's just nice factoid? Huh? How? Why it is important? I'm going to guide you. So, imagine that you have part of DNA that has a lot of GC pairs. What does that mean for that part of the DNA? For that double strand? they stronger together, so it's harder to pull them apart. Does that make sense? If you have a fragment that has a lot of ATs, it's easier to unzip. And it turns out that without unzipping, you cannot read the DNA. Does that make sense? You cannot read the sequence. Because these pairs, they face each other. This, this, the basis. A, T, G, C. They face each other. They hidden inside of the helix. They hidden here. You cannot read them unless you unzip the molecule. Does that make sense? Now, strands are anti-parallel. Which means that one strand, if for one strand the direction five prime to three prime goes one way, for another strand the direction is going to go another way. Does that make sense? So it happens. That's nature. Okay. So they arrange like this, not like this, but like this. They are anti-parallel. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. Um, so far, I keep it up. Last in, when you think about this, this, the next thing about DNA seems absolutely obvious. But at the time when Shargaf actually formulated this rule, well, he had first experimentally demonstrated. What he showed is that the percentage of A's and T's in the double-stranded DNA is equal, as well as percentage of G and C. Does that make sense? Think about this for a second. So you have 100% all nucleotides represent 100%, right? Double-stranded DNA, that is important. Double-stranded. 
if you analyze that molecule and find that there is 30% of G, what's going to be the percentage of C? 30 Do you understand why? Just, I mean, it's only common, it's obvious. Because every G corresponds to C, no matter in which strand. Okay, so it should be same percentage. Can you calculate A and T percentages? Yeah. Huh? No, no, no. Look at this. So you have 30 of G, 30 of C. What's total now? 60. How much left? 40. What's going to be the percentage of A and T? 20 and 20. Does that make sense? Okay. So knowing only one residue, you can calculate how many other um, nucleotides are in a, in, a, in a molecule. You may say, okay, so what? It's math. It's just, it's just boring. Going back to what we had this discussion with Aaron just five minutes ago, right? If you find out that you have DNA which contains a large percentage of G's and C's, what does that mean in terms of the strength? Stronger, right? Okay. Make sense? Now, one thing that I... So here we here we're moving to the stronger point. So um, you have two strands that are held together by the hydrogen bonds. Can you break down hydrogen bonds? How? Hmm? How can you break down hydrogen bonds? Huh? Heating it. Very good. Heating it. So when you heat the DNA molecule, double-stranded DNA molecule, strands separate. It's called denaturation of the DNA. Okay? Denaturation of the DNA. Why it's so important to denature the DNA? Double strand. Can enzymes read the information when strands are facing each other. No, they cannot because nucleotides, they hide the nitrogenous bases inside of the strand. Does that make sense? So they first have to be separated. You can separate by heating or cells have special enzymes that unzip DNA. Does that make sense? Right? Going back to the strand, if two if the DNA molecule has high concentration, high percentage of genes, G's and C's, in terms of the temperature that's required to separate the strands, is it going to be higher or lower? Higher, because you have to heat it up more. So guess what? If you would look at the DNA, the genomes of the bacteria and archaea that live in the hot springs, hot locations, it turns out their genomes have higher percentage of G's and C's. So the DNA can still form double strand despite of the high temperature that they, that they live in. Right? Are you following me so far? So we have discussed the structure, right? And tie parallel strands that form double helix that nucleotides are complementary to each other and that percentage of, well, Chargaff rule, percentage of G equals percentage of C and percentage of A equals percentage of T. We figured out the strength of each pair. GC is stronger than AT. And finally, we described what the denaturation is, right? separation of the uh, strands. In fact, our own ability to separate the strands, the fact that we can heat up the DNA molecule and strands will get separated, enables us to do a lot of uh, cool micro, uh, molecular biology techniques. One of them is polymerase chain reaction that we have discussed before when we talked about methods of analysis. You separate strands and now you can 
you can add enzymes that will read each strand. Okay, they will read this this sequence and can copy each strand. Okay, in other methods that make it possible is so-called recombination, when you have two different DNA strands in the um, enzyme that copies them jumps from one strand to another. Okay, combine like you know, like you're writing a book, you're copying, you know, writing something, copying something from the book, and somebody changes the book that's in front of you, and you continue copying, but it's a totally different text. Okay, now. What's going to happen to separated strands if you will start to cool down the mixture? Yeah, they will zip back together. Okay, they actually want to zip back together. Okay, so it's called renaturation of DNA. And DNA is a pretty stable molecule. Let me tell you something. It's really stable. When you look at uh, different shows like CSI and stuff like that, you know, when they go and collect samples of blood, saliva from the crime scene, and then it amazes me. It's like, it's so funny. Take a tube, take a cotton swab, swab, stick it in the tube, shake, stick it in some magic machine, and they have like a face of the guy. Well, that's bullshit. Um, but methods are very sensitive. Still, you can isolate DNA. It's probably a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, but they can do a DNA analysis, because DNA, as I've told you, is really stable. You may have heard about uh, <coughs> sorry, sequencing of Neanderthal DNA. So the scientists were able to recover uh, DNA from multiple remains of Neanderthals. And, but, of course, it wasn't the entire genome, they recovered parts of the genome, they sequenced it, then they, um, using computers, they combined them back, and now we know what Neanderthal genome looked like, okay. Recent mammoth genome, they were able to sequence it, now everybody's talking about cloning a mammoth, which is a daring exercise, and I don't think it's justified. From the standpoint of curiosity, it is, of course, I think it would be cool to have a mammoth in the zoo, right? But it's a little bit too much. We have other pressing problems. It, but it's all, you know, kind of cool projects. Project that is definitely related to microbiology. Um, sequencing of the, the plague genome. The plague epidemic of 14th century, I always mix up whether it was 14th or 15th century, that as estimated killed about a third, a third to a half of European population, including in Europe. It's pretty bad. Um, the idea was to see what it was, because you can imagine people at that time they, their description of disease was maybe a little um, over enthusiastic, and it's hard to compare the uh, old English or old German to current medical terminology. So scientists wanted to see what it actually was. Was it the actual Yersinia pestis the microbe that causes plague? Was it something else? So they went to England and they dug for remains of people who died from plague. Remains are what, 700 years, 600, 700 years old. Do you think there's a lot of things left? No, that look pretty bad, I, I, I suppose. There's one part of the body that actually stores a good deal of the DNA and actually a good deal of blood cells. Guess what? Turns out, no. Bones are not that well protected. I mean, it's obvious, first answer. Bones is the kind of second to that. Teeth. Because teeth are protected even better. And a lot of blood 
or whatever was in the blood got stuck in the pulp cavity. So they analyzed DNA material that they isolated from the pulp cavity and found, yes, it was Yersinia pestis. They have full genome. I think they actually cloned it and cultivated nothing fancy. And it wasn't like a super bug that killed everything. Simply people were crowded, there were a lot of rats, and they didn't really understand the concept of respiratory transmission at the point. So, a lot of them died. So, it shows you, DNA can actually stay pretty, pretty unchanged for hundreds of years. Another molecule that is involved in the transmission and expression of uh, genetic information is, of course, the RNA. And RNA stays for ribonucleic acid. In the molecule, you have a ribose sugar here, right, instead of deoxyribose sugar that you can find in the DNA. And if you look at those two molecules, they look very similar, except for the fact that in the two prime position, in the sugar uh, residue, you now have hydroxyl group. All you did is added oxygen. It turns out that it changes the chemical properties of the molecule entirely. In terms of stability, RNA is extremely unstable. Um, when you work in the lab and you have to isolate RNA, in many labs there is a special space. You cannot do anything else in that space except for RNA isolation. You Once you isolate RNA, you have to put it on, put it on ice and stick it into the negative 80 freezer as fast as you can. You have to avoid, you must avoid, you know, freezing and thawing of RNA. We had a joke that RNA degrades if you don't look at it right. Pretty much, if you will try to analyze RNA, you, like, you isolate it, just fresh RNA, you, you, you run it, you know, analyze the integrity, you already see the products of degradation. It starts to degrade the minute you isolated it. It's very unstable, which makes actually a lot of sense, as we will see when we talk about uh, the expression of genes. Another difference is that there is a uracil nitrogenous base instead of thymine. So RNA forms a U pairs instead of a T pairs. So far, you follow? So major differences. Ribose instead of deoxyribose, uracil instead of thymine. Another difference is in the structure. RNA molecule in the cell, vast majority of RNA molecules in the cell, the overwhelming majority, single strand. RNA forms only one strand. Does that make sense so far? unlike DNA. However, RNA can fold and form loops inside of the strand. If we will try to make a, a picture of it, it looks something like this. You have a strand, then you have a fragment where you have complementarity, okay? This is called hairpin loop, okay? So this internal, intramolecular uh, complementary structures, very common in the RNA. And in fact, those hairpin loop structures often define um, genetic properties of RNA, if I may say so. They define which part of RNA can be translated, which cannot. They may serve as the sites of protein bindings. However, 
if you heat it up, what's going to happen to that hairpin loop? It's going to go away, right? It's going to denature. An RNA molecule will straighten up. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So, based on this, we have three major differences. RNA from DNA. Ribose instead of deoxyribose. Uracil instead of thymine. One strand instead of two. Okay. So, what types of RNA molecules we can find in a cell? The short four-letter answer is many, but we're going to talk about four. First type is mRNA, which stands for messenger, which means, what does it, what does it have? What does it contain if it's messenger? Information it contains a message. This message goes from the DNA to the ribosomes carries the information from DNA to ribosomes to serve as a template for protein synthesis. Essentially, um, each messenger RNA contains a gene, in the case of eukaryotes, or may contain several genes, in the case of archaea and the bacteria. Okay, so far makes sense. By the way, since messenger RNA is the copy of the DNA fragment, copy of the gene, right? It's a, it's a RNA copy of the gene. Uh, where it is synthesized? Hmm? A little bit too deep, but you're in the right direction. Then, if not nucleolus, same general but nucleus, yes. Nucleolus, more specific function, okay? So mRNA is synthesized in nucleus. Because DNA is confined to nucleus, it cannot leave it. Well, mustn't leave it, okay? So RNA has to be synthesized in the nucleus. That's where transcription occurs. And then that mRNA uses nuclear pores <clears throat> to leave the nucleus and reach endoplasmic reticulum. Which ribosomes? RRNA. R stands for ribosomal. There you go. Well, kind of uh, self explanatory. It's a structural component of ribosomes. In fact, ribosomal RNA is certain catalytic activity. And this catalytic activity is necessary for protein synthesis. Um, I don't know um, about if you, but when you took previous biology classes, I don't know if it was what you were told. When I took high school biology, we were told that <clears throat> all enzymes are proteins. Turns out it's not entirely true. Most enzymes are proteins, but some of them are RNA molecules, ribosomal RNA. Before we move on, by the way, let's remind ourselves, what is enzyme? What does it do? It facilitates, yes, it facilitates chemical reactions. Okay? That without the enzyme would go extremely painfully slow. It makes them go lightning fast, yes. So that's the enzyme. Most of the enzymes are proteins, few of them are RNAs. Okay, and ribosomal RNA. The example of such RNA enzyme. They are sometimes called ribozymes. So you can see, well, um, rRNA you cannot see on this picture. You can see mRNA. It's pre shown here, okay. It's mRNA bound to ribosome. And now you can see tRNA. T stands for transport or transfer. So it transports amino acids to the 
side of the protein synthesis to the ribosome. It doesn't have catalytic role, but it has a role in recognizing in which place amino acid should be inserted in the newly synthesized protein. Okay. tRNA has a, a distinct structure, it's so-called clover leaf structure, with three stem loops, hairpin loops. Um, one loop is responsible for, for the recognition of recognition of the a certain sequence on the mRNA and the tail of the tRNA molecule carries the amino acid residue. Does that make sense so far? So we've got mRNA messenger, conveys the information, ribosomal RNA, part of the ribosome, um, and we have tRNA that transfers amino acids to the site of the protein synthesis. Now the fourth category of RNA that I wanted to talk to you about is microRNA. This is a great example of how amazing the field of molecular biology is. When I was in college, there was no such thing. We didn't know. We weren't taught about microRNA. Seven, eight years later, it's the buzz all over the place. Now, not teaching microRNA in in this course, for me, sounds like a crime. Seriously. Really, it's like you go into the nursing program and they don't teach you how to do the IV injection. Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's fundamental. So what is microRNA? I don't have a picture here, but I'll explain it to you. So it's a small molecule, about 20 nucleotides long, and it's double-stranded. Okay? So what it does, microRNA binds to a specific part of messenger RNA and targets special intracellular system, enzymatic system, to destroy mRNA. Does that make sense? Go into the cookbook analogy. Imagine that you have a cookbook in the living room, okay, and you made a copy of the, I don't know, apple pie recipe, and you bring it, this apple pie recipe, into the kitchen, and in the kitchen you have a robot that will cook apple pie as long as the recipe is present. So you can't even, in the blink of an eye, you have 15 apple pies, you know, on, on your counter. And this robot continues to cook them. The only way to stop it is to destroy the recipe. Does that make sense? So this microRNA regulates the degradation of messenger RNA and essentially can regulate the gene expression. And interestingly, well, viruses have some, produce some microRNA. Some microRNAs are involved in the regulation of um, Jesus. responses in, in hypercholesterolemia, but some microRNAs are tested to be used as the drug. If a person has a certain genetic disorder, produces a faulty protein, for example, given this person a certain microRNA, you can at least destroy the transcript, destroy the messenger RNA, so the person will not produce a faulty protein. Does that make sense? See what I'm trying to say? There is a faulty protein, it means a faulty messenger, faulty gene. If you can destroy the messenger, you can treat the disease. Yes. This is a destroy signal. It's like, it's like a label for messenger to get crushed. Does that make sense? It destroys mRNA specifically. 
Does that make sense? It won't create any more protein. Okay. And that's, uh, in fact, the discovery of microRNA kind of 2003, 2004, like milestone publications. The Nobel Prize four years ago, I think, 2012, something like that. So it's, it's, it, it's amazing. Things, discoveries of a huge importance, they happen at, in our lifetime. It's what, what physics was in the beginning of 20th century. That's what biology is now. We discover things that nobody could think about. Okay. So for each um, of these four types of RNA molecules, you have to understand the function. Got it? Um, genotype and phenotype. We talked about it. Genotype defines phenotype. What about the size? Generally, viral genomes, smaller than bacterial, bacterial, smaller than, say, protozoa and fungal genomes, and they are smaller than genomes of multicellular organisms. If you would look at this um, chart on the right, you will see that there is some overlap, correct? You see that? Some overlap. Um, let me see if I can. No, LCC local internet access doesn't go anywhere. Anyway. Um, however, since there is an overlap, uh, there are viruses they have genomes larger than some bacteria. Example, Pandora virus. I mentioned it, I think. It's a gigantic virus. The genome that has 2.5 million nucleotides. Bacteria mycoplasma, the smallest independently living organism, has a genome size of half a million five times less than Pandora virus. You see, there is some, you can find examples when virus has larger genome than bacteria. Okay. Um, the typical microbe, the, one of the most studied bacteria in the world, if not the most studied, the E. coli, has the genome side of approximately five million nucleotides. Okay, about 5,000 genes. What about humans? Humans have 3 billion nucleotides. It's about 20, 25,000 genes. Are we the biggest? No. By any means. The genome of salamander, is that right? You know, like little amphibian. Well, sometimes not so little. 10 times bigger than human, 30 billion nucleotides. We have no idea why. We generally have no idea why the genome of a certain organism has a certain size. Um, in fact, some of those, some of those fragments, some of those parts of the genome we don't even know if we need them. Uh, there's a gentleman in California named Craig Ventner, who was the first person to completely sequence, to determine the entire sequence of the human genome in, I think, 2003. He asked himself a question. If we take mycoplasma, it's FYI. Now that's the FYI portion, not for the exam, but just to give an idea. So mycoplasma. 500,000 nucleotides, 500 genes. I mean, it's all approximate. It's not like just exact. His question was, does mycoplasma need all 500? And he did a very interesting work where he were able to knock out genes one by one. 
turns out mycoplasma actually needs only two thirds. Well, not him person, it was like a, a big group work, but what they did, they actually then took a genome of mycoplasma and removed 270 unnecessary genes, leaving only 230 genes. Leaving only 230 genes. And mycoplasma grew just fine. Nothing really changed. So we, although we know the sequence, it kind of humbles us, it should humble us. Although we know the sequence, we often don't know what it means. Okay, it's like we learning a language, you know the letters, you know a good chunk of words, but you don't really know what the majority of words mean. You don't really know if something is meaningful or not. Okay. Now, I mentioned that genotype defines phenotype, and not just the entire genotype, but expression of genes at the given time is what defines the phenotype. And since we talk about microbes, expression of genes, microbial genes, that happen in the given time, under given conditions, is what what is going to define how the microbe looks like. So this is an example of conditions that define gene expression in the microbe Serratia marcescens. That's the one that we used just two days ago, the one that we're going to discuss today. When we used two days ago to test the transmissibility, the results are right there. Turns out if you incubate Serratia at the colder temperature in the dense colonies, in the dense culture, the colonies are going to be red, it produces a pigment. If you put the, put the Serratia at the higher temperature, it loses the color, it doesn't produce pigment at 37. Does that make sense? You're going to see some interesting results with your uh, plates. Which also, and you, we will discuss what what is the difference in terms of the environmental pressure that you can observe in different plates. So plates are going to be different. So it shows you that change of environmental conditions changes the gene expression. So you're with me, okay? And change in gene expression changes the um, phenotype. Now um, DNA in the cell, where is it? So in bacteria, well, first of all, it's in the chromosome. In bacteria, the chromosome is circular. Um, by circular, you have to appreciate, it doesn't mean you look in the cell and you see a perfect circle. It means that it doesn't have loose ends. Okay? Chromosome in the eukaryotes, is linear. It exists in a eukaryotic chromosome exists in the form of, of chromatin, okay, in eukaryotes. And each chromosome consists of multiple genes and non-coding DNA in between them. So this non-coding DNA, DNA that apparently does not participate in protein synthesis, it does not encode any information. It's often used to be called junk DNA. What is the percentage of junk DNA in the human genome? Hmm? You're too pessimistic. 90. You close. You, people usually are very optimistic about our efficiency. They say like 30, 40, 90 percent. Okay, so um, it's, it's, it's a lot, honestly. It's really, it's really a lot. But 90% of the DNA is kind of meaningless. Does that make sense? Not for me, actually. Not for me. Why we stopped, well, why it is not so popular to call it junk DNA anymore? Excellent. So we dismissed that DNA as junk, but now it may be involved in certain regulatory processes. As Michel put it, um, there are viruses called retro 
viruses that can get stuck in the DNA of the, of the humans, okay, and they, as she said, they contribute to the evolution of humans. And now, think about this. Some genes, they make you lose function. Really, it, it's normal. Some genes may lose function. Some fragments of DNA may arise as genes, okay? Now, DNA in the chromosome, it doesn't exist by itself. It is bound to proteins. These proteins are called histones in eukaryotes or histone-like proteins in, in bacteria. Now, think about it's. Um, they're like thread on the spool. Does that make sense what I try to say? So they wrapped around histones. DNA is wrapped around histones or histone-like proteins. Um, sometimes it is tightly wrapped around histones. Sometimes it gets unwrapped. This process, is that absolutely random and there is some kind of importance? And if there is an importance, when does the DNA get unwrapped? Think about this. The DNA is tightly wrapped. When you do, is that called knitting? Like, yeah, right, knitting? K N I T T I N G, when people make like scars and stuff. Um, you have thread. I'm not familiar with that terminology, so excuse me if I'm going to say complete bullshit, but you have a thread that actually is wrapped around something, correct? But you have to unwrap it to do things. DNA, when it is wrapped around histones, it's not accessible for enzymes. You have to unwrap it to read it to unzip it does that make sense does that make sense like you have to separate it from histones and there are enzymatic systems that regulate which fragments of dna are getting separated which fragments of chromosome are getting separated from proteins and which stay tightly wrapped around them so it can help you to regulate that those histones and histone like proteins they help you to regulate gene expression. Okay? Before we before we move on, so what we figured out? Chromosomes, circular in bacteria, linear in eukaryotes. Usually in bacteria it's usually one chromosome. In eukaryotes there are many. Humans aren't, do not have the largest numbers of chromosomes by far, believe me. And there's a lot of non-coding DNA in the, in the gene. Okay, follow me so far. Now, do we have any extra chromosomal DNA? Without looking at the slide, where is DNA that is not in the chromosome in eukaryotic cell? Where can it be? Is there any DNA that's not in the nucleus, in eukaryotic cell? Hmm? No, no, no. What I'm saying is, you have a cell. Most of the DNA is in the nucleus. Where else? Mitochondria or chloroplast. There you go. That's called extra chromosome. Does that make sense? So in mitochondria or in the chloroplast. In bacteria, extra chromosomal DNA can be found in circular molecules, circular DNA molecules called plasmids. You can see them here on the right. So plasmids um, are not essential for the cell survival. So if you remove the plasmid, it's not going to kill the cell. I mean, if you remove chromosome, it's not a cell anymore. If you remove the plasmid cell, it's fine. But plasmids can carry important beneficial traits. For instance, they can carry the gene of antibiotic resistance. Or they can carry toxin, which is exemplified in this picture. So on the left, 
I'm going to highlight it in the, in the green box, is Bacillus cereus, rather a benign microbe that causes mild food poisoning. We discussed it a couple of days ago. Okay, associated with rice, right? Food poison. On the right, highlighting it with a blue box, is the cell, you know, schematic cell of Bacillus anthracis, causative agent of anthrax, which is, if it goes respiratory, extremely lethal infection with mortality rate close to 90% if untreated. Okay. The difference is the presence of two plasmids that encode toxins, toxins that can kill the cells. Make sense so far? If you will take the cell of Bacillus and Tresses and remove those plasmids, Bacillus will, this, this species will stop being pathogenic. Now, why I mentioned antibiotic resistance on the plasma. Imagine, so bacterial cells, can they exchange DNA? Yes, they can. Do you remember which extracellular appendage they use for it? Starts with P. Huh? A pili. Yes. Use pili to exchange uh, information, genetic information, right? So now imagine you have one cell with plasmid, another cell without plasmid. Plasmid carries antibiotic resistance. If this plasmid can be, this can start exchanging. You now have two cells with antibiotic resistance. And antibiotic resistance will spread through the entire bacterial population. Does that make sense? That is, let me put it this way. When scientists find gene for antibiotic resistance in the chromosome, they say, eh, sad, but okay. If they find the gene for antibiotic resistance on the plasmid, it means that we bone. Because this plasmid will spread through the populations of bacteria like a wildfire. And it happened just recently. In Delhi, there was uh, the new strain of Kutsela pneumonia was isolated that carried an antibiotic resistance gene, resistance to carbapenem antibiotic on the plasmid. It was isolated a few months later. It's in the United States, in bacteria isolated from United States hospitals. I mean, it really spreads like a wildfire. People travel, people, you know, move from country to country. It's, it's unavoidable. Bacteria being brought to new, new soil and they, they continue to exchange the info. Now, the process of replication of the DNA is aimed at the preservation of the genetic information that's number one and most importantly transmission of that information from generation to generation so think about this if you have one cell bacterial cell how many chromosomes are in bacterial cell how many chromosomes just one just one now if the cell has to divide cell divides what it has to do with its chromosome? Replicate it. Okay, it has to double it. Does that make sense? So, and that is passage of genetic information to the next generation. Okay? Good? Now, gene expression. This is the fundamental scheme in the right upper corner that I will I expect you to know it 100% I wake you up well I'm not gonna wake you up in the middle of the night but somebody wakes you up in the middle of the night and asks what the central dogma of molecular biology and you tell this person DNA is transcribed into mRNA mRNA is translated into protein period how can you remember that? So, 
I, you can see that I'm a sucker for analogies. And um, DNA it consists of what? Which building blocks? Nucleotides. RNA? Nucleotides. They're slightly different, right? Just a little. But it's the same language. So I always say, what is, do you know what for language things, what is transcript? It's a written version of whatever somebody says. Like, if what you, if you write notes of what I say, you essentially prepare a transcript of my lecture. Does that make sense? It's the same language, it's English language. So DNA is transcribed into RNA. It's still a language of nucleotides, just said in a slightly different way. However, when you go from RNA to protein, you go from language of nucleotides into the language of amino acids. And when you go from language to language, you need translator, right? So it's translation. This gene expression, DNA to RNA, RNA to protein, was called central dogma of molecular biology. And um, the person who proposed it, proposed this way of gene expression, the sequence of events was James Watson, who's still alive, it's like 90 something, um, the dis person who, one of the discoverers of the structure of the DNA. So Watson, in one of his interviews, mentioned that he never meant it to be called central dogma. He hates the word dogma. But some journalists actually named it, and now it goes, James Watson invented central dogma of molecular biology. Well, he suggested that that's the way genes are expressed. But Now, expression is defined by environment. How? Something changes in the environment. What what shall happen? Which events should happen in the cell? So if environment changes, uh, it's not raining as far as I can see, but uh, imagine that you go outside, and you walk, there's no rain, and then it starts raining. What do you do? Okay, good. You run. By the way, you're going to be wetter if you run. There was a, there was a study. It, well, anyway, you run. You run to your car. Okay. Why? What happened first when it starts raining? How do you know that it's raining? That's number one. You have to perceive the changes, right? Cell has to perceive the changes. It, it through the receptors of different sorts. What happens next? So you make a decision. So there's a signaling in the cell. And then finally you run. There's some kind of response. Does that make sense? Same goes for the cell. So it has to perceive the changes. It has to make the decision and then the action is good. so we talked about perceptions receptor making the decision is going to be a number of regulatory elements that will respond to changes in the environment okay and those that response will lead to the different phenotypes okay now how do we know that okay now changes in Cellular phenotype. Uh, how do I say it? We know that phenotype is defined by the genotype. Now, what what is the major molecule that makes up the cell, except for water? What are enzymes, most of them? What what is actin, tubulin, keratin? They all proteins. So. Cell is the protein, right? It's many, many proteins. And each protein is encoded by um, a relevant gene. Things like that were not 
that obvious 50 years ago. Two American scientists, Biddle and Tatum, they did the experiment in which they um, grew the different mutants of the fungi of the mold from the genus Neurospora. And each mutant required a certain amino acid to grow. So the, the cell of the fungus had a, a pathway for the synthesis of arginine. So here's the intact pathway on top of this. You see? First enzyme makes amino acid ornithine, which is then converted into the citrulline and then into the arginine. So imagine you have a wild type fungus, which has all three genes unaffected. Does that make sense? So far. So all three genes unaffected, you throw this fungus on the medium that doesn't have ornithine or citrulline or arginine, so-called minimal medium. Okay? So make sense? So like, okay, no analogies yet. Minimal medium, no ornithine, no citrulline, no arginine. This fungus can still grow because it can make all of these intermediates. Then you take a mutant that lacks the first enzyme. You have to give this mutant or anything. It has everything else, but it can grow on the medium with ornithine. It cannot grow on the minimal medium. Then you have a mutant that lacks the second enzyme in the in the pathway. And in this case, you have a, a, a roadblock here, so you have to give the mutant citrulline. And finally, you have a mutant that has a mutation in the enzyme number three, and it cannot grow without arginine. So they demonstrated the disruption of the gene, gene that encodes this, or gene that encodes this, or gene that encodes this enzyme, leads to the very specific phenotype. Phenotype that is defined by the lack of enzyme. They established the link between one gene and one enzyme. Does that make sense? They subsequently knocked out a single gene and demonstrated that knockout of a gene led to a knockout of one enzyme. Does that make sense? They took gene away and it took out enzyme, one enzyme. So it was a hypothesis. One gene, one enzyme hypothesis. Now, this hypothesis is modified. Turns out one gene may encode a few different enzymes. Doesn't have to, but may. Okay? So take home message. First, understand the idea of regulatory elements. That cell, when it responds to the changing environment, there are certain regulatory elements that will define which genes are going to be expressed in response to these changes. Second, in terms of Beadle Tatum experiment, understand the idea that when they knocked out a gene, they were able to demonstrate that it knocks out one specific enzyme. Are we clear on that? Did I articulate my expectations clearly? Okay, I try to do that as much as I can. Um, let's talk about transcription. And how do we take a break? So transcription is the synthesis of RNA. I have a special place in my heart for this. 
um, process. That was my thesis, master's thesis project. I was studying the mechanisms of initiation of bacterial transcription. It was 16 years, 17 years ago. Uh, so the enzyme that makes the uh, before we move on, I'm going to focus on the molecular biology of bacteria. Eukaryotes, in principle, have all the same processes. They are just way more complex and involve way more enzymes. Okay. So, the enzyme that synthesizes RNA on the DNA template is called RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase creates RNA polymer. You must know that. That RNA polymerase makes RNA during the process of transcription. It consists of several subunits. Two alpha subunits, beta and beta prime subunit, and the sigma subunit. It kind of shows you uh, the arrangement of the RNA polymerase and how it binds the DNA molecule. Actually, it can be loosely represented the binding of RNA polymerase to the DNA, something like this. Okay? So it's incomplete feast. It doesn't circle around, but it, something like that. And where, where my palm is, this is where RNA is being synthesized. Okay? So, um, synthesis goes from 3 prime to 5 prime N. You can see that it reads from 3 prime to 5 prime. It, you know, it goes this way. RNA polymerase reads from 3 prime to 5 prime. So what happens first? First, of course, RNA polymerase binds to the DNA. It binds to the part of the DNA that is called promoter. Promoter doesn't encode any information regarding protein sequence. Promoter is the regulatory part of the DNA that shows where to start. Does that make sense? It's like a cover of the book. You look at the cover and you understand where the book starts. I don't have any books with me. Okay, you understand that. No, no, not, not a book. You understand where it starts. There's no significant information on the cover of the book and title page, but you know to start here. Does that make sense? Binds to the promoter. Promoter has two key regions. You don't have to know the numbers. I promised you there's, there's going to be minimal numbers. Okay? Just two regions. DNA pol uh, RNA polymerase recognizes them. And finally, it kind of slides. It slides along the DNA molecule until it reaches the site of initiation. You know where it starts. There's a a certain sequence called TATA or Tata box. Okay, Tata box is located right here, negative ten. Okay, and pretty much that's the moment when RNA polymerase is not only ready; it's already set. Now it's time for go. And then RNA polymerase unwinds the DNA. You can see the little bubble shown here. It's actually called a, a transcription bubble. So it unzips two strands of DNA. Does that make sense? This region when where DNA is getting unzipped, do you think this so which pairs are more common in that region? G C or T A? Yeah, of course, because it has to be easy to unzip, right? And then um, DNA polymerase, oh sorry, RNA polymerase, 
starts to move from the initiation site towards the 5 prime of the template strand. Before we move on, I want to ask you a question. So, see, this is the strand of DNA that RNA polymerase reads causes template strand. So, how many strands are being read during the transcription? The answer is right there in the picture. How many strands are being read? How many strands are in the DNA molecule? So you cannot read more than two, right? How many strands are actually read? Just one. So one strand of DNA is always a template. Another one is non-template. So do we need template strand? From this picture, just, I mean, what if we throw it out? From the standpoint of information, we can do that. Right? No, seriously, look at this. This strand, the non-template strand, is not being read. But interesting thing is that RNA polymerase must recognize double strand DNA. RNA polymerase cannot transcribe one DNA strand. It has to bind to two strands. Okay? Binds to two strands, split them apart, reads the template, and then they zip back. Does that make sense? It's like a, a, a bubble, bubble that, that, this is the bubble that moves along the uh, DNA molecule. It unzips, unzips at the front, RNA polymerase, reads the template strand, produces the RNA transcript and then DNA molecule zips back. Does that make sense? Now, a little bit of like a, a reminder. So let's say I have so that's going to be 3 prime, that's going to be 5 prime. What's going to be the RNA copy of the sequence that I wrote down at the left bottom corner. Mm? U G G C A Awesome. What about primes? Where's gonna be three prime end and five prime end? Huh? Yes, they're gonna be flipped. So five prime is gonna be on the left. And three primes going to be on the right because they are always in type parallel. Does that make sense? So RNA polymerase makes a run, produces the transcript, and when it encounters so-called terminal repeats at the end of the gene, enzyme starts to stall and eventually falls off. Transcription's over. Does that make sense? That's pretty basic idea of prokaryotic, well, bacterial transcription. Any questions before we go for a break? So, take a message. Know that enzyme here is RNA polymerase. Know that it requires double stranded DNA. Know that it reads and transcribes only one template strand and know the stages, okay? Initiation is when it starts, elongation when it actually synthesizes and termination when the enzyme falls off the DNA molecule. Understand what is promoter. Sequence of DNA ahead of the gene where RNA polymerase binds during the initiation stage. Are we clear? Are we? Good. Let's take a break and we will, when we will come back, we will talk about the quiz 
and we will talk about the lab.